Hey everybody, welcome back to Lost Kingdoms. It's been a little while, and we're nearly to the end game here. But we've got one more Gerd story, and as such, one more side quest that we've got to do first. Now, we get to hear about this nasty-ass polluted lake just sitting out near pretty much the edge of the world at this point. And nothing really known about this. And let me just say, this is the last side quest, besides a couple of endgame levels that kind of qualify. But this is what you get for completing every single side quest to this point. And while it's sort of okay, and it definitely has some of the best music of the game in my opinion, it's really not worth doing all the side quests. I mean, they get you a bit of experience, but most of the side quests in this game just don't feel very necessary. With that said, they can get you some decent cards, so... Now, I just love the strings in the music on this level, personally, but that's just me. I always feel like they give it a sense of urgency, even though it's just kind of a calm-looking lake, so... I don't know. Maybe it doesn't fit, but I still really like the music. Alright, so we've got an altar with a hole in it, and if video game logic is anything to go by, I need to put a thing in that hole to fix this lake. Now, I don't know what the thing's gonna be. I don't know when I'm gonna put it in the- oh, now I know. Thank you, Red Fairy, for telling me exactly why I need to- it's so convenient, too, that there's a magical cleansing artifact for this stone. for this lake, Lake Stone. So, the lake has a couple of notable enemies. Fenrils, which are not seen anywhere else outside of a card, I don't think. Also, Vampire Bushes. Vampire Bushes are interesting because they will drain the health of literally everything else on the field, friendly and enemy, and then restore its own health. So it's kind of a dick card. It's, it's not really the nicest creature to its allies, but the Vampire Bush can be fairly useful for you, because when used by a friendly character in this game, it doesn't actually have any of the drawbacks that it does when it's one of the enemy cards. I assume they did this because they thought it would be more balanced, but it doesn't really need to be balanced that much, it has low HP. I mean, you can just kill it and end it. And by this point, you'll have enough cards to finish it off pretty easily, so... Not too much need. Alright, I really wish they'd done more with that. Let me just drop very slight spoilers for game 2 here, in that that doesn't happen. You never find out anything about the other side of the Divide. They keep talking about it. They talk about another land that the Enchanter came from. That, actually, now that I'm thinking about it, we, we find out a little bit about this land. I mean, a little. But there's not much to the Divide. Like, it's a big, spacious hole in space, spacious hole in space, that a bunch of people just kind of forget about. They just kind of take it for granted. But you never really find out anything about this world. Why is there a giant hole in it? Why is there a magical thing on the other side? Why are demons contained in cards? We don't need to know any of that. That's just how it went. That's how it, that's how it goes. That is what things are comprised of. Now, there is one other enemy type here in this lake, and that's the Demon Skeleton. We're only going to see these guys, like, twice total, but if you ever wondered to yourself, what happened if you got a Water Elemental Skeleton with even more health and slightly more damaging attacks? Well, first off, why are you wondering that? That's really not a very normal thing to be wondering about, but second off, here you go, Demon Skeletons. They are complete chumps, because their attacks are incredibly easy to dodge, they can be a little bit hard to run away from, but they stagger so easily it almost doesn't even matter. But to even start what I consider the meat of this level, you kinda have to wander around the edge of the entire lake, gathering things as you go. The main part of the level I consider to be when you get on the lake, but until then you just have a bunch of adventuring to do. Now up here there is a hidden card in this bush, a free fenrel. And Fenril is the Grass Elemental 
deal damage to all enemies weak to this element card. And while the cards like the Fenril, the Behemoth for the Earth Element, the... I want to say... I want to say it's Phoenix, but I think that's wrong for the Fire Element. I'll figure it out later. But the point is, all of these cards are very situational, so unless you're going into a level with one of a single element, or all of a single element of enemies in the level, they're not going to be as useful as they could possibly be. Yeah, you can just shuffle past them, but it's almost not worth it for most stages. With that said, they are incredibly powerful, so if you feel like using them, you're definitely going to make your magic stones back, and you're definitely going to take out the enemies you want to. Okay, here's something sort of explained. Princess Helena, slight spoiler for the next stage, the woman we're fighting and we have been fighting is in fact the princess from the other side of the divide, so kind of a dark counterpart to Katia, which fits well with the whole uh, dual boss thing that they have going on whenever she shows up. But here's the main gimmick of the stage, since we just got to it. You pay magic stones, and you get to create a bridge, that's it. If you use all of your magic stones for this, you might have trouble summoning cards, if it's not for the fact that you can summon cards past lack of uh, magic crystals without actually doing anything. Across the first bridge, there is a scripted fight with a giant elephant. The giant elephant is actually sort of tough. It has a lot of HP, fairly solid turn rate and a very large AoE attack. Attacks that bring you out of the battlefield for a time, like the Lich or like the uh, Dragon cards, have a fair chance of helping you out significantly against the uh, Elephant here, but the Elephant is also notable for one other thing, and that is the fact that technically this isn't a boss monster. So, it is entirely capturable. This is one of the only places besides leveling up an elephant, in fact it might be the only place, that you can get an Elephant King. And, as previously mentioned, Elephant Kings are very good cards. They deal a lot of damage in a large AoE, so... A new one, a second one, isn't oh, really that bad for us. Now, the cost does go up with every single bridge you make, so by the end of this, you're going to be paying quite a few magic stones, and you cannot sacrifice health instead of them. But here we are, we're all ready to the boss fight at this stage. It's the Hydra. Do you remember, like, eh, I don't know, almost six or seven episodes ago, I think it was, maybe more, that I mentioned that the Hydra was a boss monster that we could just buy from Gerd's shop? Well, here you go. Though, if truth uh, be told, it's not actually that hard a boss. The Hydra requires you to be right in front of it to, for it to hit you with its poison breath attack, kind of like a zombie dragon. The only difference is the Hydra's turn rate is abysmal. Just completely garbage. And if you're thinking about trying to capture this one, like the elephant, don't bother. It can't. It's coded as a boss, so you cannot capture the Hydra. With that said, you can still buy it beforehand or get it as a reward from this stage, so take that for what it's worth. Now, you may be tempted to just kind of go ahead here, but you do actually have to go to this little treasure chest, but then again, why wouldn't you go to a treasure chest? I mean, the entire point of the side missions is to get more stuff. Well, this particular chest has the Stone of Cleansing in it, which almost looks a bit like one of the rune stones. I think they use a similar model. And we, c you can at this point just say, screw it, I'm leaving the way I came, I don't want to spend any more magic stones, I'll just walk around the entire edge of the arena. Or, you could start going across these last couple of bridges, which are a massive shortcut back to the beginning of the stage. 
So, truth be told, this stage is actually pretty short, but the enemies can be kinda tough, especially if you don't have the proper damage to just deal with them, because there are a lot of tanky enemies in this area. But they're really not that hard to beat. And if you're still just stacking lizard men in your deck this late in the game, you'll still probably do alright because there are a bunch of water elemental monsters here. But of course, Kraken, uh, Kraken still remains king. Special place in my heart, all that. Now, I can't remember one thing though, and that is if these fights are scripted. They may very well be scripted, and it's just coded that you will find an enemy encounter whenever you step onto a new island, but even if it's not, encounter rate is moderately high in this area, so you're likely to encounter mostly one by each time. And by the power of VFX, the uh, water changes tint slightly and sparkles appear over the video. Which signifies, of course, that things are happy and clean. Now, I already got the Hydra, so I don't need to get the boss drop for this level, which is pretty nice because it's not the most interesting level to play. But, it is still a fairly solid level, and it has some actual sort of interesting visual design and a decent size, so it's nothing really as concentrated and admittedly boring as the chapel, but it's not exactly the pinnacle of map making here either. That comes a little bit later. So Alexander has little to nothing new to say to us, and he's not even giving us a new card yet, so I don't know why I'm bothering. Gerd has given us her final side quest of the game, so we really don't need to bother with her much more anymore. And next time, we're actually going to go to the Colosseum to fight Helena. I'll see you all then. See you all then.